Good morning, let's get started. Any questions? Any questions? Questions? So for the question is for uh, the midterm remarking. Uh, some people are giving me a piece of paper where they describe what is the problem, what I should look for. Uh, others have sent me an email, so both of them would work. Any other questions? Okay, so let me uh, summarize what we said on Monday, which was a very dense lecture on magnetostatics. And uh, the lectures will be a little bit denser moving forward because we will be building on what we learned from electrostatics to understand magnetostatics. Uh, so the fundamental observable here in magnetostatics uh, does not involve charges anymore as in electrostatics where we had uh, the forces that developed between either charges of the same kind which was a repulsive force or charges of different kind that, uh, that is an attractive force. The ma fundamental observable is that if you have two wires uh, that support core directional currents then uh, those will actually be attracting. Uh, it is uh, something that uh, we, one can uh, formally show. If the, uh, or observe an experiment, I have a demonstration for you tomorrow. Uh, if uh, the currents are co contra directional, then there will be a repulsive force. That force is described by the ampere, by the ampere force law, just like the electric force is described by the Coulomb uh, law. Uh, so that involves now two elementary currents, I1 DL1 and I2 DL2. Of course, for these currents to exist, you have to imagine that they are part of a bigger circuit, something like this, a closed circuit. As you know, currents flow on closed circuits. However, Ampere was able to state, isolate the force between those two elementary currents alone. Because they are elementary currents, just like point charges, you can assign a position vector to them. So they are not big enough so that you don't know uniquely their position. The position effectively is a point and therefore you can assign a position vector to those two currents. And the force that is applied on the second wire due to the first, that is the source of the force is the first wire and the victim, if you wish, uh, to use a term that they are using in uh, a branch of electromagnetics that is called electromagnetic compatibility, uh, where you are uh, trying to figure out whether uh, circuits that are close to each other induce noise on each other. Uh, you are too young, you don't remember the old telephone lines where you would uh, actually uh, pick up the phone and you would hear someone else uh, speaking on the line because those old telephone cables had a lot of crosstalk, as we used to say. That was because magnetic field produced by the wire or that was going to one customer was being coupled to the wire of the other customer and then the other customer was able to pick up the signal uh, that uh, was uh, intended for uh, the first customer uh, in this example. Uh, so this uh, issue of uh, uh, noise comes into the electromagnetic compatibility and in that case uh, the circuit that picks up the noise is the victim. So the victim here is I2DL2 that receives this force uh, and uh, the force is given by this expression. And in this expression, what is here in the brackets, just like in Coulomb's force law, depends only on I1DL1, does not depend on I2DL2 and that is now what we call the magnetic flux density B that is generated by the first, uh, by the first wire. So formally, that's how we define the magnetic flux density. Units of Tesla, after the famous uh, engineer who worked with uh, an inventor and genius that worked a lot with magnetic fields, uh, Nikola Tesla. So that is now the magnetic flux density. Let me uh, put that name on the board. that is created by this I1 DL1. So now if we have, and by the way, what is here in the box is called the Biot-Savart law. So basically this ampere force law gives you two things. It gives you the magnetic field that will be the magnetic flux density that will be produced by the first current. 
and second, it gives you the force. So based on this um, uh, formula alone, on Monday we showed that if you take a long wire, infinite wire along the z-axis with current I, the magnetic flux will be circulating around the wire and will be given by this formula. Mu naught I by 2 pi R. Mu naught, again, is the magnetic permeability of free space. It's a constant. It's a constant. Uh, I can also, at this point, define the magnetic field intensity, H, so that is now the counterpart to the electric field intensity, E. And in free space, this is defined as B over mu naught. So in this case for the wire, the magnetic field uh, intensity, which is uh, given in units of amps, per meter, so for the infinite wire, uh, the magnetic field intensity would be uh, I divided by 2 pi R uh, phi hat. So no mu naught in this case. So now based on that, there is this second aspect of this formula. I can find the force that would be applied on a wire due to the presence of this uh, first wire. So going to the force calculation now, uh, which is uh, quite relevant to your, fair, your uh, lab that starts on uh, Friday. So let's say I take this wire. I have the magnetic field. The magnetic flux lines, as you see, come out of the board and go into the board. So they are loops. And I'll be using quite a bit this notation in magnetism now. Uh, the dot means that the line comes out of the board. The X means that the line goes into the board. So you see these magnetic flux lines are looping around the current. So this is uh, how they look like. In a two-dimensional uh, projection of this picture. So now if I put in a, another cable... in here at a distance d. Calculating the force that the cable receives is actually fairly easy. I just need to go and apply uh, the um, ampere force law. So let me uh, call this uh, current I prime. So I apply the ampere force law on a small segment of the cable. So that segment of the cable alone And I'm looking at this small segment because the ampere force law it's, is talking about, just like Coulomb's law is talking about forces between point charges. Here we're talking about forces between um, current elements. But in this case, I do have the magnetic field. So I will use the total magnetic field. So the force that I have there is I prime dz z hat cross product with the magnetic field. So now I'm reading this formula as IDL cross B. So I'm not going to redo again the splitting of this current to multiple IDLs and the integration and so on. I don't need to. I have done this already. Now that I have the magnetic flux here, I apply this formula that F is I to DL cross B, the magnetic field. And uh, that magnetic field is uh, mu naught magnetic flux density to be more precise. 2 pi, R, uh, 2 pi R phi hat, 
and obviously now r is the distance between the two cables is what I defined as d. So I put it in here. So you see z cross phi is minus r hat. And I have also nu not i. So the per unit length force and I repeat this the per unit length force on the second wire that was the point where we stopped uh, last time uh, I call it df over dz, that is I divide out uh, dz and I have the 2 pi d obviously here will be minus r hat mu naught i times i prime divided by 2 pi d. So you see that if the currents are co-directional their product will be positive and the force And the force will be attractive, will be towards the minus r hat direction. Just like uh, we expect from our observable. Of course, here we assumed already that uh, i uh, points upwards. But anyway, it, it could be the case that both of them point downwards. And uh, if uh, they are contradirectional, so we have this situation. Then you see you would get a minus sign from here. You have another minus sign from there. So then your total force would be pointing in the r hat direction and would be uh, repulsive. So then you would see a repulsive force just like we have in magnetic levitation trains where there is a repulsive force between uh, the underneath of the train and the tracks precisely because you are closing a circuit and therefore the current that flows underneath the train is opposite to the current that flows on the tracks and that's how you get this repulsive force that makes the train float over the tracks. Uh, so this is uh, what we had said on Monday and I repeated it uh, so that we are all on the same page. Yes, please. In terms of magne magnetic uh, property itself, right? What, what are the two poles, those two opposite ends uh, like uh, identified? Are those both north poles, north poles or south poles, south poles or when it's smaller than zero? So the question is about uh, south and north poles and it refers to magnetic materials. So let me discuss magnetic materials separately. So you see for now this is an outstanding question that is how does this kind of magnetism that relies entirely on currents relate to the kind of magnetism that you are most familiar with which is the bar magnets let's say attracting uh, pieces of iron. So we'll get there later on. So for now I don't get into poles. Yes. Right, so the physical meaning in free space is uh, very minor. Uh, in um, materials, it's more important. So it's very similar to the difference between D and E in electricity. In free space, D is equal to epsilon naught E. Uh, however, if you are in a material, then you have the dielectric permittivity. So likewise here, when we get into materials with magnetic properties like magnets that your uh, classmate was asking about before we will see a more important difference between B and H. So for now I keep it simply as um, analogous quantities where the, uh, the ratio is controlled by this mu naught the magnetic permeability of free space for pi times 10 to minus 7 a very small number that's why also these forces are very small and you cannot observe them in your circuits lab. Um, another thing that you can observe here is that this magnetic flux density depends on mu naught. If I have another material uh, other than free space with magnetic properties you will see that this mu naught will change into mu naught mu r just like in electricity we had epsilon naught epsilon r whereas the magnetic field intensity uh, relates only to the source and it is i by 2 pi r. Yeah. For free space it also depends on mu naught, no? Okay. Uh, as you see the magnetic field intensity is i by 2 pi r, does not see mu naught. 
So likewise, if you put a magnetic material, the magnetic field intensity will also remain I by 2 pi R. So pretty much like uh, D actually in electricity. Okay, uh, so I have uh, now two extensions of this concept. Uh, both of them are related uh, to your, uh, to your uh, lab. Uh, so first is force of a magnetic field on an electron beam or on a moving charge. So let's say that we have a magnetic field that goes into the board, uh, sorry, comes out of the board, this B. And inside this magnetic field, there is a charge Q with a velocity V. Why does this uh, situation relate to this situation? It does because fundamentally currents are charges in motion. So now that you have a moving charge, essentially you can map this to a current. And indeed, if you observe this uh, charge over a time interval um, dt, so from uh, t naught to, let me just draw here, to t naught plus dt, right? So I observe this uh, charge moving. Uh, the interval that it has traced is dl equal to v times dt. So if the velocity is v, my interval of, of observation uh, is dt, then basically the segment that it traces is dl. So over this segment then, I have over time uh, dt, a charge q appearing. So for this segment, DL, there is a there is a current I, and that current, remember, current is time rate of change of charge. So indeed, I didn't have a charge. The charge comes in over time dt. So from zero it goes to Q, and therefore I have a current or an equivalent current that is Q dt, okay? So therefore, I have the IDL that I was looking for in this law, and that is uh, Q dl over dt, which is QV. So the ampere force law then tells me that there will be a force on this charge that will be IDL, which is QV, cross product with the magnetic field. Cross product with the magnetic field. So this is the force that the charge is receiving inside the magnetic field. If we run the cross product, you have the velocity, you have the magnetic field coming out of the board, so therefore this force will actually be perpendicular to the velocity. And because it is perpendicular to the velocity, it doesn't produce any work. It cannot accelerate the charge. Uh, you can accelerate a body if you are applying a force along the direction of its motion. But here, this is actually a force that is always staying perpendicular to the motion of the charge, and therefore it can only act as a centripetal force, set it in a circular motion, but it doesn't produce any work. No work, no acceleration. Why? Because the force is perpendicular 
to the velocity. So therefore, it can produce no force, uh, sorry, no work and no acceleration. Yes, please. Why is the force uh, a pro product of QG with uh, like a magnetic flux density? Flux density? So the question is, uh, why is the uh, why I used this uh, formula? This formula is that formula. IDL cross B. So you have an IDL inside the magnetic flux density B. The force that you get on this IDL is IDL cross B. So I simply applied this formula here and uh, I argued that what plays the role of IDL over there is actually QV. Is QV. So I don't have a current in the sense of a wire, but I have a current in the sense of a motion of an electron or of, of a charge. And therefore, that IDL that this ampere force law is talking about is in fact represented by this QV. And uh, that is uh, something that uh, finds applications in spectrometry, spe in mass spectrometry. So you can basically distinguish particles based on their masses because of this. Um, so this is what we're uh, talking about here. Uh, a charge enters this magnetic field and then it receives that uh, force that sets it in this circular motion. And obviously if you have a different mass, then the circular motion will be different. And therefore it will, the particle will hit this wall of this chamber at a different point. So this is a, a, a way to distinguish particles based on their mass and is that what we call mass spectrometry. So you distinguish that the particles end up at different points on this chamber based on their mass. And it's another way also to measure the mass. Uh, because the force acts as a centripetal force, there is this uh, formula that says that, uh, that determines the radius of this motion. I can, uh, for a moment, let me uh, start from that board. I will keep this on the board. So for a centripetal force, F, which is uh, basically this uh, QVB is mv squared over the radius. So you see that the radius of this motion, this circular motion, is directly proportional to the mass. of the charged particle and that's why we can use this to do mass spectrometry. Any questions up to this point? Question? Yes, please. I'm not sure the content, but is the, the last due this week or does it start next week? It starts ne this week. Okay, because based on the, the debate, yeah, you're right. Yes. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, can you go over the relationship with uh, force with velocity? Like, why this particle? Oh, uh, so the question is why the velocity is perpendicular to the force? It's because the force comes from a cross product. It comes from the cross product that involves the velocity and the magnetic field. So if you uh, go back and look at the cross product, you will see that V cross B is a vector that is perpendicular to both V and B. And it's given by this right hand rule. So V cross B gives you this force that points downwards. The flux density, again, I'm using this uh, notation to show uh, flux that comes out of the board. So we have velocity 
flux density, velocity, flux density, the force goes down with the right hand. Okay. All right. Um, I have one more uh, application, but uh, maybe I will uh, reserve it for tomorrow. It is the whole sensor if you uh, have um, heard about it. And uh, I will um, actually get to something that is even, again, related to your lab. And by the way, if you are taking the lab this week, you don't have to fill out the quiz. Uh, so we have made an announcement that we have given an extension of one week for the quiz for those who have the lab this week. Uh, precisely because we're uh, covering the material now. Okay. Uh, so just uh, since I have here the projector and to introduce the, to introduce, uh, the next topic, Uh, let me talk about the, this DC motor. That's another um, device that is based upon forces from the magnetic field. Uh, so here necessarily I'll talk about, I'll, I'll, I have in this diagram a magnet. Uh, that magnetic field obviously could be generated by a set of currents. So it doesn't have to be by a magnet. Uh, so these uh, lines show the direction of the magnetic flux density. And uh, you see that uh, we have a, a frame that uh, experiences a torque and keeps moving inside the magnet and it's uh, rotating. In fact, when we calculate those two forces that are opposite to each other, we will see that their net sum is zero. So the net force that goes onto this frame is zero. But there is a torque, another notion from mechanics that becomes interesting here in the context of applications of magnetic fields and magnetic fluxes to generate machines uh, like this uh, DC motor. So I will um, try to look at a version of this problem. And uh, my title will be Force So the first uh, part was the force by the magnetic field on an electron on a, uh, on a um, beam, on a single, ch on a moving charge, in fact. Uh, so we didn't have a beam, we had just one charge. So second will be force by a magnetic field on a current, on a current loop. So just to make things easier, instead of having a rectangular frame like the one that you saw in the DC motor, I'll put a circular frame inside the magnetic field. Uh, so this is the, uh, the geometry. X-axis, Y-axis. So I have a frame, a circular frame of radius A. This is the current I. And uh, that frame is inside the magnetic field. And uh, that magnetic field will be in the Y direction, constant magnetic field in the Y direction. Okay. So we have a constant magnetic field with flux density B equal to B naught Y hat. Okay. So if I take a small segment here, IDL, on this loop, that will receive a force DF that is given by the Ampere force law. So a segment IDL uh, and uh, that DL, I will express it in cylindrical coordinates. Here we have a circular 
loop. So the length of uh, this dl is radius of the loop times d phi, and it is in the phi hat, in the direction of the phi hat uh, unit vector. So that IDL receives a force DF that is IDL cross the magnetic field, the magnetic flux density. So again, I'm applying this formula over there, IDL cross B. So now my B is this one, it's Y hat B naught. So I have to calculate this cross product. The phi hat unit vector is minus X hat sine phi plus Y hat cosine phi. So therefore phi cross Y will be minus x hat sine phi uh, plus y hat cosine phi cross y. x cross y is z hat with a minus sine minus z hat. y cross y is zero. So cross product of unit vectors with themselves is zero. So this is what we have. And I put it back in the force and I see that the force DF will be uh, minus Z hat uh, I A D phi uh, sine phi B naught. So if I look at that force, this is the loop here, this is x, this is y, sine phi is positive for phi going from 0 to pi. So this is the, the region where sine phi is positive, this is the region where sine phi is negative. When sine phi is positive, the force is in the minus z hat direction. The minus z hat direction. So the z axis comes out of the board. This is the z. So when sine phi is positive, you have a minus z hat, um, a minus z hat force that actually goes into the board. That is the direction of the d phi. And when sine phi is negative, you have a negative number here, a negative sign. So overall, the force will be in the plus z hat direction. So it will be coming out of the board. So you see, if you integrate the force over the entire loop, because of the sine phi, if you integrate sine phi from 0 to pi, I'm not even doing this, it is zero. So the total force on the loop is zero. However, you have this part of the loop that experiences a force that goes into the board, the other part of the loop that the force comes out of the board. So despite the fact that the net force is zero, it still applies a torque and can turn the loop. So this is the principle of the DC motor. This is exactly what we saw in the movie. I did this for a a circular frame so that uh, we can work this out uh, much faster. So net force if you integrate this uh, minus z hat i a d phi sorry a b not 0 to 2 pi sine phi d phi that will be 0 because of this integral. So the net force is zero, but we have torque. Uh, 
uh, and honestly, I didn't remember <laughs> anything about the definition of the torque until I started uh, doing this course. Uh, so I will remind you that when we have a force at a point, the corresponding torque here will be R cross the force. So it is yet another, dot, another cross product uh, that you get by taking the cross product between the position vector of the point that experienced the force, that is this position vector here, r hat, and the force itself. That gives you the torque. So we will see actually that there is net torque, as you expect, there is net torque on this frame if we do this calculation. So dt, if I put here the position vector, what will be the position vector of this? Which one? So this uh, loop is on the z equals zero plane. The position vector in cylindrical coordinates is r r hat plus z z hat. Here z is zero, so it is r r hat. But r is the radius of the loop, so it is a r hat. And then we have minus z hat, the force. Okay. Minus z hat, i a d phi sine phi b naught. Okay, so this is it. R cross z. Remember the table I uh, did on Monday? R phi z, R phi z. R cross z, you can find it right here. It gives you minus phi. There is another minus sign there, so it will be plus phi. A times A gives you A squared. I A squared b naught sine phi d phi. And before I do the integration, I will replace phi hat which, with its expression in Cartesian coordinates. Sine phi plus y cosine phi uh, i a squared b naught d phi. And I had a sine phi uh, somewhere here, which is very important. So I put it inside the parentheses, and that will give me minus x hat sine squared phi plus y sine phi cosine phi i a squared b naught d phi. Okay, so this is the torque, the differential torque that is applied on this element only. So to find the total torque on the loop, I simply have to integrate this from zero to pi. Yes, please. Um, sorry? Is torque a moment of momentum? Uh, momentum. Moment of force. Yeah, I think yes. Again, I, uh, <laughs> my, my uh, knowledge of mechanics is a little bit uh, rusty, but uh, I think you are right. That is R cross F also the moment of force. Yes, thanks. Uh, I was wondering why did you have to convert the sine phi into like the Cartesian coordinate again? Because, so the question is, why did I replace uh, phi hat into uh, it's Cartesian expression, it's because I'm about to integrate it. So what are the integration bounds that you are doing? You said you are integrating. The integration bounds are given by d phi and also by understanding what we're actually doing here. So I'm trying to find the total torque on the loop. I'm finding the torque on this one segment. This is the phi of the segment and now I will be moving the segment all around. 
So the integration bounds will be the bounds of phi, which is from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, because how how do you integrate phi hat? How how would I integrate phi hat? But how? What is the integral of phi hat from zero to pi? Unless I have the Cartesian expression, I cannot do the integration. Phi hat by itself doesn't give me anything to integrate. Okay. Let alone that uh, one might think that it is a constant that you don't need to integrate at all, and then uh, find uh, something totally different. In fact, uh, zero. So you need, to in, you need to do the replacement so that you express it. You have a sine phi, and then you have something to integrate. Otherwise, I can integrate it. Right? Any other questions? OK, so now I have to integrate this. Let me just say here that I have two integrals that are important. 0 to 2 pi sine squared phi d phi is pi. And 0 to 2 pi sine phi cosine phi is 0. So you see, integrating this, uh, this uh, expression will give you a non-zero result only from the sine squared phi. Okay? So whenever we are integrating a phi ha any unit vector that is not Cartesian, you express it with respect to Cartesian coordinates so that you can integrate it. Otherwise, you may be led to the wrong conclusion that it's a constant, and then you take it out. If I had not done this replacement and thought about this as a constant, then my result would be zero, because the integral of sine phi is zero. Okay, so then you would defy even your intuition that there is torque in the loop, and that torque cannot be zero. So all in all then, just to reach the end of this, um, uh, calculation. I have a torque uh, that comes from integrating this expression. Let me just put the entire expression in from 0 to 2 pi plus uh, cosine phi, and then I have the i a squared b naught d phi. Okay. So this is it. The first integral will give me pi, so I have minus x hat pi a squared b naught, and then I have the second integral that gives me zero. So finally, the total torque that I have on the loop is minus x hat i pi a squared b naught. Okay. So this loop has a specific name. It's called a magnetic dipole. And uh, And generally, a magnetic dipole is a loop that can be rectangular or it can be of any shape, elliptical or uh, circular, as we saw here, that carries current I constant throughout the loop. The loop itself defines an area let that area be S. So here, this is the area S. And we define as the magnetic dipole moment. So I will uh, leave this uh, uh, here and I will write on this part of the board to define the magnetic dipole moment. So the magnetic dipole moment for this system uh, is given by a vector 
that has length, the product between the current and the area, and points in the direction that is defined by tracing the current with your right hand and using your thumb to find the direction of the current. So as you have a loop like this, the magnetic dipole moment points upwards. So this is the magnetic dipole. We are interested in these magnetic dipoles generally because we have such systems inside natural media. And this is the fundamental uh, connection between the kind of magnetism that we saw here, which is magnetism created by currents, and the magnetism that, that you have in magnets. So inside magnets, inside magnetic media, you have such things, magnetic dipoles. Why? Because of the orbital and spin motion of electrons. So just like before in the example with the charge in motion, we were able to define a current. Likewise, when you have a spinning on an orbiting electron in a molecule, you can see it as a system like this that creates a current that flows along a loop and therefore it creates a magnetic field. So the, mag the magnetic field and the magnetic flux that you are observing when you buy a bar magnet is fundamentally the same as the one that I'm talking about here as the magnetic field that is created by uh, current wires, current carrying wires. The reason being that in natural media, you have those currents being naturally created by the orbital and spin motion of electrons. So this is the connection. Let me just give me one small moment to say here that if I look at the magnetic dipole of, the, of this loop, if I go back to this example of my uh, DC motor, uh, the way that it, it is receiving this torque, if we see it in three dimensions now, we have the loop here. We have the magnetic field that is uh, in the y direction so i'm uh, let me plot it again so we start by having this loop on the xy plane that's where it is so uh, its initial uh, dipole moment points in the z direction. So initially, this loop has a magnetic dipole moment that is in the m, that is in the z direction. So that is the initial magnetic dipole moment m. And now it receives this torque, and you see that this uh, torque tends to turn the loop in this direction. You see it pushes it downwards from here and pushes it upwards from here. Uh, in fact, uh, sorry, I pushes it uh, downwards from here and upwards from here. So it tries to turn the loop in the direction that I will draw, I'll draw now. It is this direction. So basically, in this direction, the magnetic dipole moment will be in the y direction. So what has happened here? The magnetic field has created a force that created a torque that turns the loop in a way that it tends to align the magnetic dipole moment with the direction of the magnetic flux. The magnetic flux was always in this direction. The magnetic dipole moment started from Z, but with uh, this torque it goes to the Y direction and then so here it starts from Z and then 
it basically becomes parallel to the magnetic field. So this is a very characteristic feature that we have in the interaction between currents, frames, closed currents, and magnetic fields. And that is how we magnetize media and we create permanent magnets. You come in with a magnetic field that maybe you create by wires, you apply it in the medium, and then the magnetic dipoles inside the medium will tend to align their magnetic dipole moments with uh, the external field. So this alignment is very uh, characteristic. And finally, you can show that with this definition of the magnetic dipole moment, the torque can be expressed as m cross b. m cross b. So you can uh, work it out and show indeed that uh, with the magnetic dipole moment being here i pi a squared z hat, if you take the cross product with the magnetic field, you will find exactly this torque. So I will stop here. We will discuss much more about magnetic dipoles because of their fundamental role in the phenomena of magnetism. Uh, but I will stop here for today. So thank you for your attention. See you tomorrow.